Well, good morning, Greenwich, and welcome to the Monday, June 6th edition of the Basement Academy. Our psalm this morning, Psalm 126, we've read a few times in the last couple of years. It's one of my favorites. It's nice and short. <laughs> um, it, it, it's set in the context of the return of Israel from exile, the, the captives being brought back home, back to Zion, and the joy that comes with that. And so it recalls the tears as they went out, and then it implies there's a, a harvest upon their return. There may be a physical harvest as they come back to, to labor in the land, but it may be this spiritual harvest of perseverance and of a deep and abiding faith. And so Psalm 126, this is for all who find themselves in a season of struggle. When the Lord brought back the captives to Zion, we were like men who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us and we are filled with joy. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. He who goes out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with him. Amen. Lord, hear our prayer <clears throat> for one another in such times. Okay, let's read on in the book of James. Chapter 2, beginning verse 14. What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, Go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe that there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish man, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. In the same way was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Mm. This is the passage that Martin Luther uh, found some fault with. <clears throat> he thinks it undercuts uh, what St. Paul teaches about justification by faith, that is being set right with God uh, by faith. I, I don't think there is a contradiction. There's some tension perhaps, but when you understand uh, what's, what's going on here. And so James has a concern that he's been uh, lingering with, going back to chapter one, it, it, it is to keep our faith active and vital and living. Uh, he's already expressed the concern for hearing and doing the word. Do not be a hearer only, somebody who just like looks in a mirror, recognizes something, but doesn't act on it. That is, you look in the mirror, see that your hair needs to be combed and you've got a little, you know, a little spot of ketchup or something that needs to be wiped off. And, and so... The, the, the idea is you hear the word of God, you, you, you come to believe, but you have to act on that, that you have to embrace and do 
the word of God. So it's hearing and doing, belief and obedience. Had Adam and Eve uh, obeyed in the beginning, we wouldn't have been thrown into this mess. Uh, faith and action, or faith and deeds, as, as he writes here. And so th there is this, I think this passage flows from what we've just read, the passage about showing favoritism. You go to a meeting, go to church. Here comes the rich guy. There's the, the, the guy in shabby clothes. Don't show favoritism and preference for this rich person. Uh, in fact, you probably should pay more attention to the poor man because he has real needs. And I think that's what prompts this uh, example that uh, James uh, gives us here. Uh, suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If you say, go, I wish you well, keep warm and fed, but do nothing about their physical needs. What good? So, so I think there's a connection to what James has just been, been writing about, about mercy. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's the, the perfect law, the royal law that gives freedom. And show mercy, show compassion, kindness, tenderness uh, to the person in need. Don't just feel kindly towards them. Don't just, oh, it just breaks my heart to see that person there in such great need. If it breaks your heart, do something about it. And so James is trying to give kind of simple examples, okay, that it, you got to act upon the neighbor uh, in need. And then he lifts up, of course, um, the examples of uh, Abraham uh, and, and Rahab. And so this theme that certainly in James, I believe it was true in Jesus as well, right? The concern for the Pharisees, they, they outwardly had the appearance of faith. They spoke, they talked a good game. But what they were really doing is they were playing to the crowd. So their, their alms, when they gave them, were not to support the poor. It was to be seen by men. Their prayers uh, were not really to honor God and to intercede on behalf of others. They were to be seen um, praying and, and, and the so on. And so I, I love this one uh, verse. I guess it's verse 19. You believe that there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that. And of course, they shudder. And so you can recall when Jesus was about his ministry, uh, these demon-possessed people would, the, the demons would speak out, we know who you are, you're the son of God. And so even the devils recognize, even the demons and the spirits recognize that Jesus is the Christ, that God is one, God is, is, is real. But of course, the demons don't, they, they don't obey God, right? They don't, they don't uh, serve God. They, they wish to serve a malign power that rebelled against God. And so, you know, all the talk about, oh golly, what is it these days? Something like 92% of Americans say they believe in God, you know, when these Gallup polls go out, that, that stuff, it, it sounds impressive, but you have to drill down. Well, well, tell me about the God you believe in, first of all. Do you believe in uh, God the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, uh, God who is the, 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 the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who offered his life uh, as a sacrifice for the world and in whose name alone we find forgiveness and salvation. Do you believe in that God? Pfft, that 92% is going to go down, right? And even those who say they believe in God may not be acting upon that. There's no expression. There's no daily prayer. There's no engagement in worship. Um, you know, no contributing to the needs of the saints or uh, et cetera. But I believe in God. Oh, well, great. Okay. That's just humanity being made in the image of God. We have a sense of a transcendent. We have a sense. We were built to be in relationship. We were fashioned to be in relationship with God. So, of course, people believe in God. There's a sense that there's something beyond them. But 
you know, is there action? Is there service? Is there worship? Is there um, a life that, that comports with that, that belief in God? And that's what James is, is after here. And so action ends up being the credible evidence, the visible expression, the completion of faith and, and belief. Um, I've got, I've got here on the whiteboard, for those who are listening to the um, podcast, you don't see the whiteboard, of course. One's stated values do not necessarily always reflect their embodied or lived out values. Uh, maybe a simpler example would be to say, I value exercise. A lot of people state their value for exercise, their value for good nutrition, but they never exercise and they don't watch what they eat. So to say that you value this thing, that it's important, it's important, exercise is important to me. Well, when's the last time you exercised? Uh, maybe three or four years ago. I don't know. I don't, I don't do that much. Okay. I, I I value good nutrition. Well, why are you eating bags and bags of Doritos and sugary uh, soft drinks and, and the like? Well, yeah, well, I, I value nutrition. I, I want to be in good shape. Okay, well, it sure doesn't look like it. And so this this disconnect from the things we say we value and believe in and hold to be important and the way we actually live our lives. And so the, the activities that reflect Christian faith, participation in a worshiping community regularly, praying, so, so, so I mean, actually going to church, right? Not, not just saying, oh, I, yeah, I, I believe and I think it's important to go to church, but I don't go to church, right? And I recognize we're in COVID and some are, you know, doing church at a distance, but are you doing that faithfully, okay? So the, the stated values uh, of Christian belief are, well, worship, worship of the triune God, uh, belief in the name of Jesus, participation uh, in worship, in the sacraments, uh, receiving communion, um, saying daily prayers, reading one's Bible, attending to the needs of neighbors, uh, giving of one's uh, resources and time uh, to serve others, um, or somebody showing up without clothes and food and say, you know, and then are you doing anything about that? Okay. And so, and so this is the challenge, right? Uh, so, uh, James, I love, he pulls this word together again, uh, this, this word about completion and maturity, teleos. You see that his faith, so talking about Abraham, you see that his faith and his actions were working together. That's the key. Faith and action, faith and deeds, hearing and doing, always are working together. They're two sides of the same coin. You see that his faith and actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. It's that word complete. There it is again. So we've seen that word already. James chapter one, consider pure joy when you face trials of many kinds because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must complete or finish its work so that you may be complete or mature, uh, not lacking anything. Uh, the, he, he wrote about the perfect law that gives freedom. Every good and perfect gift is from above and then the perfect law. So this word teleon, which has at its root meaning the, the completion, the goal, the fullness, the maturity, the wholeness. Um, this is what Jane, well, this is what God is after. Jesus spoke about that. Be perfect, be whole, be complete as your Father in heaven is whole and complete. 
And so he's lifting up how Abraham's faith, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteous. We read that in chapter 15 of Genesis. But in chapter 22, God says, okay, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love and meet me on the mountain. Okay. And so uh, Abraham saddles up, grabs Isaac. At one point, Isaac's Daddy, I, I, I see that we've got the wood and, and, and we're here, but I don't see the sacrifice. And as Abraham, you know, is ready to plunge the knife into Isaac, it's, it's a stunning passage, right? He looks up and there is the ram caught in the thicket. Uh, it turns out that the place where Abraham offered Isaac, Mount Aruna, is also um, uh, David had an encounter there on the threshing floor. That's where um, uh, sacrifice was uh, um, offered to stem the plague and David's sin of the census. That becomes the same place where the temple was built. And we've talked about that before on Sunday mornings, but it's this stunning reality that the same place where um, uh, Mount Moriah, I guess, is, is uh, in Abraham's uh, uh, telling of the story, the Abrahamic story. Moriah becomes the, the threshing floor of Aruna, becomes the place of the temple uh, where sacrifices are offered, which is just a stone's throw from where Jesus was offered uh, in, on Golgotha. <clears throat> so stunning reality and so Abraham's faith is made complete. It's working together. There's a wholeness to it. And so what James is really pointing out, this is the human condition. So he's writing 2,000 years ago, but he could have written this yesterday, right? It, it's, it's the problem you face. It's the problem I face. It's the problem we all face. We state values. We hold things to be important. Um, being good with our money, being disciplined, um, planning for our future, uh, talking to our children about God um, or other things of importance, um, exercise, good nutrition. We humans are full. Uh, we, we know what the right thing to do is often, right? Uh, we know to be respectful. Uh, we know to mind our manners. You know, we, we, all these things we know, we state these as values and important but we don't always act on them. That's the human condition. Paul wrestles with this in Romans chapter seven. Wretched man that I am, the thing that I want to do, I don't end up doing. The thing I don't want to do is what I end up doing. Temptation seizes us and we give in and we, we submit ourselves to something that we know is going to be harmful or destructive or diminish our lives. And so James is just wanting to be clear, you know, uh, this, this tr the, you know, because he's, he's writing to a persecuted people. We think that's the context, right? The tribes that are scattered. So don't, you know, your faith is important to you. Your faith is kind of what's gotten you in trouble, right? Your faith in Jesus. But hey, understand that that faith has to be an active expression, don't just, you know, oh, I believe and I'm not going to say anything about it. I'm not going to act in any way so as to reveal who I really am as a believer in Christ. And so anyway, let, let me stop there uh, for today. Uh, we'll pick up uh, again tomorrow and try to tease out some of this, you know, salvation by works and salvation by faith thing. Okay, let's pray. Father, thank you uh, for the this, this passage in particular by James that calls us forward, calls us out. Uh, forgive us when that which we state is important to us is not how we act. And so lead us, Lord, to a more consistent life, hearing and doing, uh, believing and acting. And we thank you uh, for the actions of Jesus on our behalf by laying down his life. Uh, teach us so to live, uh, so to follow, uh, so to sacrifice on behalf of others, that our faith might be complete and whole, uh, reflecting uh, the salvation that is in us uh, through Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray and who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. May God cause his, his face to shine upon you this day, this coming week, as we study and learn and grow together. And may God enable your faith to be completed by actions of love, service towards your neighbors this day. Amen. Amen.